Hey, hey, folks. Welcome to the show that punches you in the face with information, but in a good way. It's Maximus Radio. Today's guest is Maximus Mark. Yes, that's right. Today's show is the Ask Mark Show. I'm your host, Chris Trintopoulos. As you know, Mark is the creator of Maximus Radio, where he interviews world-famous health and nutrition experts and asks them all the tough questions. He's the author of Eat Your Way to Abs and The Truth About Supplements, trainer and biosignature practitioner to some very notable people, including fitness and bodybuilding champions, models and some very savvy business people. Yes, Mark's advice is sought after, and today I have the pleasure of picking his brain. So let's bring him on. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, Chris. How you doing, man? Good. Good. And yourself? Good. I'm very good. Awesome, man. So let's get into it. The first question we have is about calories. It reads, um, where are we here? Yeah, it reads, I've been following you for a while now, but I can't seem to understand why you're so against counting calories, Mark. All righty. So um, let's, let's start. That's a good question to start off with. So counting calories, the, the thing about counting calories is I, I, I really personally see it as a very backward approach when we consider the fact that Counting calories, the, the methodology and the theory was developed in somewhere between the 1890 and basically uh, 1900. So um, it, it really has been uh, over 110 years that we've been walking around with this theory that we've accepted as nutritional dogma. And, you know, it, it's over 110 years old. But the problem with counting calories is that, as I explained in, in my seminar, You Ate a Wabs, we're basically essentially saying it was, it was Wilbur Atwater, an agricultural chemist who, who actually developed the theory, and he put all these foods into a caloric oven. And think of a caloric oven as, as like an oven where you, you put foods in and you measure the energy. So let's say, for example, you put sweet potato in, in the oven and it reads, let's say, 120 calories. Okay, well, and he, he devised, okay, there must be uh, you know, nine calories in fat, six calories in protein and all that all that stuff. But essentially the problem with it is what we're actually saying is this this caloric oven equals our digestive system. Now, let's just really think about that for a second. A caloric oven is a closed energy system. So, in a sense, we put food into it and we measure the energy. There, there is only one reaction that can take place. We, we, we literally, we burn the food to ash. That's the only thing that can happen. And it's the only thing that does happen in a caloric uh, oven. But when we, we look at the human body and the human digestive system, we are so complex. We have so many factors. Did you know that if you if you feeling a state of anxiety, if you feel in a state of depression or anger and you eat a meal, that that meal will digest very differently than if you're relaxed and you feel good and you're around people who you love. So, I mean, that's just, that's just one factor out of, out of many. You know, let's consider obviously genetic, environmental factors, what we're eating, our enzymes. Uh, there's so many different things. Hormones that play such a massive role. So to really just say calorie, you know, it's all about calorie counting is very short-sighted. And another point that I always say is that, you know, if calorie counting was the be-all and end-all, you know, technically we could, we could all eat dirt and survive hundreds of years because dirt technically, you know, it, it, a calorie is a calorie, right? And dirt does contain calories. So why can't we eat dirt? I mean, there's minerals in dirt. Obviously, we can't eat dirt because um, the reaction that takes place in our bodies uh, are very different. And in a sense, one thing that I teach all of my clients um, and readers is that I look at the human body as a, as a walking, living, breathing chemistry set. And when we put food inside that, that chemistry set, different reactions take place. And, and this is where the magic happens. And I always say that the dollar is in the detail. And the, the detail is, is understanding what are the reactions, what, happen, what happen when we put those foods into our body. Because there are very different reactions. When we put, say, sugar into our body, obviously when we put sugar into our body, insulin, our, our blood, first of all, our blood sugar rises. And because you know we can't have elevated blood sugar levels because we'll end up uh, uh, in metabolic acetosis, insulin needs to be secreted from the uh, pancreas to bring that blood sugar levels down and drive that blood sugar levels, uh, drive the sugar, I should say, into the muscle cells or into the liver or into the brain, wherever it needs to go. So, I mean, that, that's one reaction that happens with sugar. But, you know, what happens when we eat protein? What happens when we eat fat? And, and that, again, that, that is the key factor in, in all this. And I, I really, my heart goes out to a lot of people who think that um, calorie counting is the only way to do things. And I, I do believe that counting calories promotes a very unhealthy lifestyle. I don't think we'll ever really made to, to obsess about calories. And, I mean, there's... 
Weston Price in his book, uh, Nutrition and Physical Generation, he spoke a lot about different healthy cultures. You know, he asked the question, what makes these people healthy? And he studied healthy cultures. Won't go too much into Weston Price, but the point is none of them counted calories. Okay, and they were all some of the healthiest cultures on earth. The, 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 the almighty Hunza, the, the Hunza tribe, the Mazai, um, in the people in the Swiss Alps, all those different cultures were extremely healthy, but you know, not, not one of them ever got out their calorie counter and, or calorieking.com.au and said, oh shit, you know, this, this milk has 200 calories in it. I better not drink as much of it today because I'm watching my calories. No, none of them. It, it's actually absurd uh, when you think about it. So, Calorie counting does, I think, attribute to a lot of people's uh, eating disorders. And when I say eating disorders, being so far removed from the way we're actually supposed to be eating. You know, we, we need to be eating things that are hunted, fish gathered and plucked. And when we focus on counting calories um, as, a, as a means to get in shape, we really do lose sight of what we should be eating because it's almost a, a, a theory to justify, you know, let's, let's eat crap today or let's eat crap every day, but it's okay because we're eating within our calories. Now, I think people would get a lot faster success while focusing on what they're actually eating rather than counting calories. I think calorie counting will always leave you um, disappointed and frustrated and headaches with the result that you're getting. And as I said, my heart goes out for a lot of people who think that's the only way. But unfortunately, um, your mainstream nutrition and, and Western culture have really indoctrinated people that it is all about calories when it, it, it really isn't. And if, if anyone listening wants more information on that, the, the best book on the topic is um, Gary Tabs's his masterpiece, Good Calories, Bad Calories, where he you know goes back and he documents in full detail. I think from the 1864, it starts with um, William Banting, who wrote the, the first low-carb diet ever, which was called A Letter on Corpulence. And, um, you know, and he, he documents pretty much you know, lots of research, lots of study, lots of science, and really has a very good analytical look inside the world of how misled we've, we've actually been with calorie counting. And the read, he has another book called um, uh, Why We Get Fat. That's also a good read too. Yeah, beautiful, Mark. That leads me to a quick question just on that subject. Yeah. What's your opinion on calories in, calories out, or that way of dieting? Well, again, it comes back to what I was saying before. So calories in, calories out all comes from, you know, if you expend 2,000 calories today, you know, you're, you're on the treadmill and you, you, you expend 2,000 calories, then you must, uh, you know, eat 2,000 calories to, to keep up. But again, the way we burn fat is dependent on hormones. So, you know, gro- growth hormone, for example, which has been very popular with a lot of pro bodybuilders, you know, growth hormone gets you very, very lean. That's why lactate training works so well because it boosts growth hormone. That burns body fat, okay? So we really need to understand, and the best analogy that I can think of is, actually, there's two analogies. First, one is um, in, in cancer patients, for example, tumor, uh, the, the tumor takes in more calories than it expends. Yet everyone in cancer research knows that. The question is why? Why is that tumor taking in more calories? Well, is it hormonal? Is it genetic? What, what is actually happening? How can we stop that? So that, that, that's point number one. Point number two is let's consider um, two, two uh, I guess, little kids. One's a boy, one's a girl. You know? and, and when the boy goes through puberty, he gets ripped. He gets muscles. He loses fat. Um, and, and, you know, he, he, he actually loses fat, whereas when a, um, and, and puts on muscle, whereas when a girl goes through puberty, what happens? They actually gain weight and they start growing and, and putting fat in places where that makes the boys go, hey, so what, what's really happening there? Well, obviously the hormones and the genes and, and all that mastery system that we call the human body are sending different signals out, telling and directing where the calories they need to go. So, um, calories in versus calories out, again, it, it's going to lead people to frustration because it doesn't address what humans are. And essentially, humans are biochemical machines. Calories in versus calories out, all it addresses is a simple math statement that makes it really easy and palatable for different authors who don't want to do their research to sell different methodologies so they can make a quick buck. It doesn't work. It never will work. And it doesn't address the human psyche, it doesn't address how we think, it de- and it definitely doesn't address how we feel. We can't, we can't go on with calories in, calories out at the forefront of mainstream nutritional dogma. Um, yeah, sure, calories do part, play a part in the game. You know, you can't just you know sit at home and eat butter and meat and, and drink milk um, all day long and expect nothing to happen. But um, you know, it, at the same time, I mean, there have been many studies published where. 
um, people will try and sit at home and eat butter, meat, milk, and drink all those, those high, higher fatty foods, and, and they get too full. They can't eat anymore. But if you put someone on a very high sugary diet or a very high carbohydrate diet, it, you know, they're, they're almost hungry when they go to bed eating the same amount of calories. So again, calories in versus calories out um, will leave you frustrated. Did that answer the question? Yes, yeah, so hopefully that clears it up for a lot of the listeners out there as well. Yeah. Then next, you talk a lot about controlling cravings. How would, you, how would one go about that? Controlling cravings, again, it comes back down to what you're eating. So, you know, we have this hormone that's made in the fat cells called leptin. Leptin is uh, really the, the appetite control hormone. So, but what regulates leptin? Well, I mean, there's, there's many different factors, but essentially when you, when you eat a highly processed or a highly sugary type of, of food, let's, let's use in this example, um, we have uh, Pringles potato chips because they coined the saying, once you pop, you can't stop, which is very true, not only from a, a psychological perspective because you like the taste, but from a physiological perspective, meaning that what happens, let's look at it from a chemical perspective. Well, you know, your blood sugar is going to be elevated. You're going to get the salt, which once you, when you're having salt, you want to crave more of the, more salt. You get a craving for more salt and more food. Um, and you know, in a, a lot of foods, especially, say, for example, something like Tim Tams, this is a good example. I can't remember what E number it is. E numbers are basically um, preservatives. And if people want more information on E numbers, there's a good documentary made by the BBC called um, The Wonderful World of E Numbers. But I digress. Um, there's an E number in Tim Tams. I think it's uh, E505 um, that is actually banned in the US. Uh, why is it banned and why do they add it in Tim Tams? It's actually because it's it's, it, 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 it acts as an addictive substance for people to keep eating more. Um, it, it, it improves the... Um, I guess the Moorishness of having Tim Tams. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd imagine there's, there's a lot of preservatives. And if you look at the back of any ingredients and you read the list and there's things in there that you can't pronounce, um, you know, a lot of them aren't, are put in there to obviously increase shelf life, but to improve flavor. I mean, I had a conversation with Randy Roach, who I had on, on this very show a little while, but he was actually the first person I had on this show. And he made a very good point about how, you know, in, in when he was, a, when he was much younger, he used to buy potato chips and he would have a few and it would be fine. You know, he wouldn't eat the whole bag. Whereas, um, you know, he bought a, a bag of potato chips just recently and, you know, bang, he ate the whole bag without even thinking twice. And he really reflected and said, how did I do that? How, how did I actually eat the whole bag? And a lot of people, again, coming back to calories in versus calories out, beat themselves up because they think, oh, you know, I, sh I should only be able to have one Tim Tam. I shouldn't have to eat the whole uh, bag of potato chips. And they beat themselves up thinking that, you know, they should have more willpower and self-control. But if we really understand how these foods digest in our body, we actually understand that we're producing and we're creating our own cravings. We're, we're self-perpetuating our own cravings and what happens in our body. Again, coming back to the, the um, sugar analogy, what I was talking about before about sugar, but when we increase uh, sugar levels, uh, leptin uh, gets downregulated, which means when leptin gets downregulated, the best way you, you want to think about that is, is imagine driving in your car, the, the dash light comes on that you, you, know, you have a flat battery. So instead of fixing the battery, what you do is you, you pull the cord, the, light, the, the cord that lights up the dashboard, and you keep driving. It makes no sense. Um, so essentially, leptin is, is your dashboard control. Um, just because you, you know, on, on, in a car, just because you can't see the problem doesn't mean you don't have one. It's the same thing in the human body, but except a lot of people don't understand um, the signals that, that are created or the signals that happen when we eat such foods. Again, um, Lipton downregulation will definitely cause you to, to eat more, more of the bad stuff, and that's what these foods essentially do. So in, in terms of controlling cravings, what I recommend for my clients to do um, is, number one, really, really figure out whether you, it's actually hunger um, or you're actually craving a food. And usually cravings, like people will say things like, um, you know, I've never heard anyone say I'm, I'm really craving um, broccoli and, and or, you know, these type of foods or, or beans. No one ever talks about craving beans or broccoli. It's always, you know, I'm craving potato chips or I'm craving nuts or I'm craving something that's not good for them. And, and most of the time it's a withdrawal reaction from that food. Um, for example, you know, salt. People want potato chips for the salt doesn't necessarily mean your body needs the salt, but that's what it's craving. So people can mistake what the cravings actually mean. So again, what I tell my clients to do is, is eat it before they, you know, eat whatever they want and, and you know, think that it's a real craving is eat a proper meal, eat some chicken, eat some protein, eat, eat a steak with butter, you know, use butter and, and boil up some vegetables or steam your vegetables and 
put butter on your vegetables and have a meal like that. If your craving goes away, um, great. You know, you, you've just uh, you know nipped it in the butt. If it doesn't. And it's something that you just like, oh, I just really feel like it. And it's more of a mental thing. I tell people just to go ahead and have it. Um, but usually at that point, when you've eaten a proper meal, you know, you, you, your men- mentality goes back to, um, to, you know, you don't crave those foods. Does that answer the, the question? No, it doesn't make it very clear for everyone, I guess. Yeah. Um, definitely. Next question was, why is gluten such a problem? Oh, gluten. I've got a whole presentation on um, gluten in my Eat You Ate A seminar. But the thing about gluten is it, it well, there's a number of problems with gluten. First of all, I'd like to, because I'll go, I'll, I'll answer the question, but at the same time, I'm going to direct people to more information. If they want more information, I did a show with the man, Dr. Tom O'Brien, you know, consider him the Michael Jordan of gluten. He, he is the man. I've got his eight hour DVD, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, watch and listen to. I learned so much from uh, Dr. Tom O'Brien and Brian, but why is gluten such a problem? Well, number one, it's everywhere. And most people don't understand how gluten actually works. So let's first start with gluten is a, is a protein strand that's found in wheat, rye, and barley. Now, there are over 60 toxic peptides to gluten. Um, and in most tests, especially in Australia, most tests only test for one, max two different peptides to gluten, uh, which means that you know there are 58 different peptides that people could be getting an allergic reaction to or a mild reaction to. The problem with gluten sensitivity and celiac disease is that it, it doesn't manifest overnight, which is obviously a good thing for a lot of people because they don't get sick fast. But it manifests for, and if you look at the research, it manifests for people around the ages of 30, 40, 50. So it takes some time. You see, to be diagnosed as celiac, you need total villi atrophy. Now, if you think of your villi as in your intestines, you've got little shags inside your intestines, and essentially, when you're a celiac, those shags are completely worn down. Now, the problem with that is you can't have 50% of your shags worn down to be diagnosed. You can't have 90% of your shags worn down to be diagnosed. You need to have 100% of your shags worn down to be diagnosed. And as, as Dr. Tom points out, there are many stu- numerous studies that show um, that can the villi can heal itself when going on a gluten-free diet. But why is gluten such a problem? It's because it causes uh, both an immune reaction in the body and an inflammation reaction in the gut. So the immune reaction is that you've got these things called cytokines and lymphocytes that are kind of like your chemical bullets that glute, basically um, your body sees gluten as a, um, uh, I guess, as an invader as such. So digestion, first I need to talk a little bit about digestion. Digestion is, in a sense, removing the bricks from the mortar, okay? So I like to think of it as Tetris blocks. You know, you've got these Tetris blocks that comes in. It's like a big clump of, let's say, 50 Tetris blocks. And digestion is essentially moving removing the Tetris blocks so we get um, you know, a monopeptide, a tripeptide, or a bipeptide that can be easily digested and, and used, Okay. But when we when we digest gluten, it can uh, happen in you know I said before about there's over sixty toxic peptides to, to gluten, it, it, it gets digested in clumps, and because it's in clumps, our body in a sense needs to send out these chemical bullets to go and destroy it, and you know imagine little chemical bullets being shot out to to destroy that clump uh, and break it down in the body. Now the, you think that's a, that's a good thing, you know, and that is a good thing, but the problem is is that uh, we have gluten for breakfast, we have it for lunch, then we have it for dinner, and then we wake up the next day and we do it all over again, and then we wake up the next day and we do it all over again, and then we wake up the next day and we do it all over again, and we wake up the next day and we do it all over again. So what's happening is this constant signaling of lymphocytes, uh, cytokines, and these chemical bullets that are constantly in our system trying to break these things, and that causes obviously inflammation and an immune response. And um, because we have these things called memory B cells, memory B cells um, are like when you get a vaccination, for example, if you go over to uh, you know Africa, you need measles, mumps vaccinations months before you go over to Africa, but when you, when you actually, you know, when you're about to go two weeks before, you just need a booster. And because of these memory B cells, we're constantly getting... Um, we're constantly making antibodies to gluten because we're having it all the time, and that causes the the problem. And in a sense, you, you, one exposure to gluten will cause the inflammation and the immune response for up to ninety days. Okay, that's why it's such a problem. You can't have a little bit. You can't be a little bit pregnant. It has to be all or none. You need to get the gluten out of your diet. And the most ridiculous thing I've seen to date is Gloria Jeans Cafe having their low gluten range. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't make a difference if it's low gluten or high gluten. A little, as, as, according to uh, the World Health Organization, 
20 parts per million is enough to cause a immune reaction by gluten, which means that if you have a million pinheads out in front of you, you take 20 of those pinheads, that, that's how much gluten actually takes to cause that immune reaction. That's why you can't be a little bit pregnant in a sense of it will cause the immune reaction and it will cause the inflammation in the gut. And um, a lot of people think, well, gluten's not a problem for me, but uh, gluten is, uh, is linked, over to fi- oh, linked to over 55 diseases. And to quote Dr. Tom O'Brien, um, if you don't feel a million bucks in life, you know, you should feel a million bucks in life, but if you don't, gluten is probably the best place to start in eliminating. And it is something that I get all my clients to to, to do and um, to try, at least to try. And, you know, I have, I have a huge success rate in, in getting um, clients gluten-free because as a client, I do give people recipe books and all that type of thing. Um, but the other thing is, I just had a recent example. I've been trying to get a client uh, gluten-free for, for over two years. Finally, he goes, all right, Mark, came to my seminar and he goes, all right, now I understand why you've been telling me for the last two years to get off the gluten. He got off the gluten. I saw him the other day, weighed him. He lo- he's already lost four kilos in two weeks. Um, you know, this stuff works. So if you want to get in shape, you want to get in shape fast, get rid of the gluten. It will do you a world of good. And if you have little little kids, I'll definitely recommend a gluten-free diet. But as I said, the man on gluten is Dr. Tom O'Brien. You know, I need to give him a huge shout out because I've learned most of what I know about gluten from him. And he has been on my podcasting show. So definitely check that one out because it's, uh, he, he drops massive bombs. And, you know, come to Eat Your Way to Wabs because I, I really explain a lot more about gluten there. So to cut gluten out of your diet, you got to eliminate it 100%, yep? Yeah? You can't yeah, have just a little bit. you got to eliminate it 100%. There, there's no two yeah. ways about it. Yeah, sweet. But, but the other thing I would say to the listener as well is, is there is a continuum. And what I mean by that is, you know, you might listen to this and be inspired to cut out gluten, but then, you know, once a week you, you eat whatever you want and you might have a pizza. Well, I tell people, you know, if you're going to have a pizza, that's fine. Just get a gluten-free pizza. Or if you're going to have a, a burger, you know, one of our, our favorite burger places is grilled, you can get gluten-free bread at Grilled. Um, and, you know, if you go out to, to Thai restaurants, you say, you know, I'm, I'm gluten-free and soy-free. And, you know, they most restaurants, I went to a Thai restaurant just the other night, and I told them, you know, I'm gluten, I need to go gluten-free and soy-free. And they, they were more than happy to oblige by that. Most restaurants are. And usually the food tastes a hell of a lot better because they use real ingredients um, when making it. So um, in, in, in that, you know, as I was saying, there is a continuum. You might go to once a week, you might go to once a month, and then you might go to once a year. Let's say every Christmas, you might have um, you know that piece of cake or whatever it is um, that's not gluten free. And again, you can make there's plenty of recipes that you can make gluten free. But then you know you might decide one day that that's it, no more gluten. That's it. So there's a continuum, and and don't be overwhelmed. Just start. Yeah. Now, right, awesome. We'll move on from that now. Uh, let's say I'm a bodybuilder and I really struggle with the off-season diet. What, do you have any suggestions for that? The off-season diet? Well, yeah, number <laughs> one, um, get out of the mentality of, of having an off-season diet. The thing is, I, I suppose I, I see a lot of uh, competitors and a lot of bodybuilders um, you know, every day, and I speak to a heck of a lot of them online um, via email and that type of thing through my, my programs. But... The biggest mistake and the biggest thing that I guess, body, not to single out bodybuilders, but the biggest mistake that they make is, is, is the mentality that, that goes in towards it. You see, what happens with a lot of people, and again, my heart goes out to a lot of these people, but what happens with a lot of people is they compete once. And then because they've competed once, they get, uh, I guess, taken away with the community. And once they've been taken away with the community, they think they're a part of something. And when they're a part of something, they take it on as their identity. And when they take it on as their identity, they walk around for the next year saying, I'm a bodybuilder, I'm a bodybuilder, I'm a bo-. And they've in, I guess they've ingrained in their head that they're a bodybuilder. And because that now they're a bodybuilder, they start to fall for bodybuilding myths. Let's say, for example, they start having oats and eggs in the morning. They, they have to have oats and eggs in the mornings. They have to have a protein shake after their training. They have to eat every two hours. And they do a lot of this stuff in spite of what their body is actually telling them simply because there's no other way to say it. They're part of a cult called bodybuilding. I mean, uh, not, not, again, not singling out bodybuilding, saying bodybuilding is a cult. You know, I, I think Apple, Apple computer is a cult, but hey, I'm an Apple user and I love Apple and I'm happy to be part of the Apple cult. But the, 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 the point is this, is that people who struggle with the off-season diet uh, is simply because they, they, they have a, a dichotomy between the two. You know, they're, they're either all or none. They're really good or they're really bad. And 
it's the mentality that goes into that and it's their identity that, that holds them back in a sense. What they really need to understand is that you don't need to eat shit food to put on muscle and put on weight. In actual fact, the more good food you eat, the better you'll be. And, and having balance, you know, having balance in life. And I think one of the biggest problems with a lot of bodybuilders um, is, is the fact that they lose sight of other things. You know, bodybuilding is quite an art, you know, I'll put my hand up when I was competing, I was in this category. You lose sight of, um, what's really important in life. You lose sight of, um, you know, other things like career, finances, family, going out and having fun with, with friends and all for the sake, for the, for the sake of this word that we hold dear called sacrifice. Um, sacrifice is great. Don't get me wrong. I've had to sacrifice a number of things to get to where I am today and, and, and discipline and all that type of stuff is good stuff, but needless sacrifice is silly. And I see a lot of bodybuilders needlessly sacrificing, um, to get to where they want to go. Um, and, and I, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but people just got to kind of step back and say, where am I in the scheme of things? You know, when I'm in a 90 year old person, when I look back, um, will I remember this or will I be resentful of myself for putting myself through this, this misery um, that I'm creating? You know, And there are some people on this planet who are put on the planet to get on a stage and compete in bodybuilding. And that's fantastic. And you know, I wish those people all the best. But the people who really struggle with the off-season diet, I would suggest that they need to get their lifestyle in order um, and, and have other things besides bodybuilding um, that, that make, that they get satisfaction from, you know, training and all that. It's, it's absolutely fantastic, but just don't lose sight of the real things and the more things. And, and I guess the, the analogy that I'll put on it, on it is if, if I give you $10,000 and you invest that $10,000 once into one stock in the stock market, or if I give, you know, Bob over there $10,000 and he invests that $10,000 10 times into 10 different stocks, if if you if your stock goes up, you're manic. If it goes down, you're depressed. If Bob's stocks go up, he doesn't care. If his stocks go down, he doesn't care. And the the the, the point that I'm getting at is the more hobbies and the more things you have, um, the more stability you have in your mind, uh, which makes you a more stable person. And again, coming back to the bodybuilding, is that a lot of people invest all their eggs into one basket, and that's all they have. All they have is bodybuilding. And if they can't train. That's it. You know, they're, they're depressed people. If they can't eat properly, they're depressed. If they miss a meal, they become depressed and it all becomes too much. And I find, again, one of the things about building muscle, burning fat, all that thing is, is your mentality, is your attitude towards it. You've got to have a good attitude. You've got to have a good mentality. Um, it makes things so much easier. Yeah, so you're not a believer in um, the off-season bulk and the summertime cut? or Not, not at all, not at all. Not for the sake of health. I mean, look... If you look at some um, anthropological text, uh, you know, it, it does suggest that in summer is when actually food was plentiful and we got fat, and in winter, uh, food was, was, you know, scarce and we had to uh, fast in a sense. We, we couldn't eat as much because we were on rations. So I think from, from the extent the human body has been evolved and adapted to deal with fast uh, and famine type of situations through seasons because the fact is through seasons we... Um, that's that's how we ate our food. That's how we genetically were, uh, I guess, evolutionary were adapted to eat. But we got to really look at what what that was and how we actually do it today with bodybuilding. Um, and with bodybuilding, you know, a lot of the time when you mention that word bulk, people are bulking on sugar. Well, sugar, or I should say, sugars. So, for example, you know, muesli bars, protein bars, all these type of um, processed and refined foods. Now, sugar suppresses the immune system, and your uh, immune, how strong your immune system is, is correlated to how much muscle you can build. So, I'm a, I'm a fan of, of, you know, if you want to eat up in, say, summer or winter, that's fine, but what foods are you eating up on? You know, eat up on the good stuff, not on the bad stuff, and then cut down in the summer, that's fine, but um, let's really address a healthy lifestyle and what, let, let's define what an off-season diet is. You know, most off-season diets that you see... Uh, they're just filled with utter useless crap, um, and there's no other way to say it. Yeah, cool. So what do you reckon is wrong with nutrition today? Nutrition today is that we've all been sold a lie. Uh, the lie, the, there's so many lies in nutrition, um, mainstream nutrition especially, again, from uh, people often skim the surface of the details and they don't get into the nuts and bolts of what, what is really important. 
I think with the internet, there's a lot, there's a constant demand for content. Um, you know, people are constantly trying to market things and constantly trying to, you know, sell their message or sell their product or sell their supplement, whatever it may be. And because of that constant demand, people are, are often trying to redefine uh, what nutrition is and what training is and what fitness is. When, you know, the ABCs have been written, you don't need to rewrite the book. You know, most of what we, we need to succeed has, has already been done. Um, so to specifically answer your question, there are multiple things that are wrong with nutrition. My, the thing, the, probably the biggest thing that I see wrong, wrong with nutrition is, is this. We've had to, for the sake of money, uh, we've had to globalize the food supply. Now, to globalize the food supply, we've had to also sterilize the food supply. Now, let's think about that. All the goodness that used to be in food is now no longer. Food really should be a local, a local industry. You know, you, you should be buying your meat from a local farmer, your veggies from a local grocer, and you know, getting your raw milk from a, your local dairy, dairy cow. But that doesn't happen today. So um, what's wrong is that these food corporations like Monsanto and ABM and all these other ones uh, have come in and basically raped land's resources. So, for example... You know, healthy soil should contain multitude of different vitamins, minerals, um, and nutrition. Soil is is very alive and a very active uh, substance in the in the ground. You know, it, it's it's living, breathing. It's doing all those good things. It, it eats. Soil needs things to eat. But um, you know, thanks to the green revolution, we we learnt how to make our own uh, fertilizer using fossil fuels. Um, and now the the world's most used fertilizer is NPK, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And because of that, our soil only contains three minerals, and that's where our food comes from. And and again, why do we do that? So food manufacturers can have more turnover, we can feed more people, and we can essentially the food corporations can make more money. So what's the biggest problem with today is that we've we've completely disconnected from the earth of how we should actually be eating and um you know we're we're putting money before health that would be that the biggest problem is that money and finances and you know in brackets quote unquote advancing the human race is at the forefront when it should be advancing the, you know advancing the human race but in what context you know we're definitely not advancing the human race in terms of health um if anything and definitely stats and statistics would support this We've got it much, much, much worse from a health perspective, and we've lost sight of, you know, of health. A lot of people lost sight. Most people, it, it's, it's, it's getting rarer and rarer. Um, and fortunately for me, I see healthy people all day because you know I'm inside the gym. But it's getting rarer and rarer for for healthy people. If you're a healthy person, it's almost a rarity. Um, it's almost expected that something's wrong with you. It's expected that you don't sleep properly at night. It's expected that you're depressed. So, you know, what is it? One out of three people are, are, are chronically depressed or are on antidepressant tablets. That's that's not normal. That, it, it's not supposed to be like that. But it is that way because the foods that we're eating are completely void of nutri- nutrition. And that's that's, for me, that's the biggest problem is that money is driving this whole thing. And I guess to go one level deeper is that people aren't aware. They're not aware that money is actually driving nutrition and the fact that it should be a local community and we should be buying foods from, from local grocers. So a lot of people are missing out on the minerals and nutritional value of real food just because they're unaware of what's really going on. I absolutely believe that to be true. Um, I absolutely do believe that to be true. I mean, for me, uh, I guess clinical uh, experience of seeing, you know, when I when I help someone and, and, and give someone magnesium or zinc to supplement with and the next night they go to sleep properly and they, they don't wake up in the middle of the night, for me that's, 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 pr- that's, that's proof enough um, that it made such a profound difference that they're actually getting the minerals and vitamins they need from the supplement, but normally you would be getting that from food. So I definitely see there is a need to supplement. It's just what you're supplementing with. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So we'll move on from that. What's the best way to put on muscle? See, that, that's a very good question. The best way to put on muscle, I mean, I'll, I'll give you this answer in um, because I am cognizant of time, but I'll give you this answer in, I guess, 20 seconds, and that's the fact that you need to eat. You need to eat and you need to train properly. Um, when I say you need to eat, you need to eat the right foods. So, you know, the blueprint that I that I suggest for people, you're, if you want to put on muscle, you're going to need to eat more meals. So let's say anywhere from four to six meals a day, every meal containing as a minimum, depending on your body weight and all that type of thing obviously affects that. Um, you know, around 200 grams of food, not, not grams of protein. I don't measure things in grams of protein, but grams of, of food. So say a 200-gram chicken breast with, um, let's say, 
you know, as much vegetables as you want. Now, the reason why I say that's a, you know, you definitely don't need to get into the habit of, of measuring everything. You know, you, I encourage people to, you know, that's, that's enough food for me today and, I, and eat that. But if you're looking to put on muscle, you are asking your body to do something that, that is extra, um, out of the ordinary. So eating more, you need to eat more. You know, if you've always done, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. So to put on muscle, you do need extra, extra protein. There's no doubt about that. Um, and extra food, extra fats. Fats are anabolic. Use butter. Um, best way to put on muscle is have a structured plan, have a structured training program. Um, go to someone who, who knows what they're doing. Um, model. I'm a big fan of modeling. If you want to get somewhere fast, find somewhere who's, someone who's been there and pick their brain. Ask them what they do and, um, you know, learn from them. You know, I've a lot of, I've had a lot of success training people to put on muscle. So, uh, people are welcome to contact me, um, and, uh, you know, happy to help them. Awesome. I read, um, that you don't really recommend oats. Oats are the staple to any bodybuilder's or healthy person's diet, aren't they? Why don't you like oats? Yeah, yeah. Oats, oats are a staple to most people's diet, and I like to challenge the status quo. And, and you know, most people, most bodybuilders, are waking up in the morning and, and they think it's it's almost this religious experience where you have to have oats in the morning. I know at least when I got into bodybuilding. I had this stigma that, you know, what else would you have for breakfast? It's oats and eggs, you know, like you can't have anything else. And I think that's a really dangerous line of thinking. So here's the thing. We spoke briefly before about gluten, but um, oats grown out of the ground don't contain gluten. But there is this thing called cross-contamination where the truck that hauled wheat yesterday contains oats today and the, the wheat obviously contaminates the oats from the truck. So therefore, those oats now contain gluten. So unless your, your oats are completely and specifically gluten-free, then you're probably you're fine. But otherwise, your oats may be containing gluten. So if again, if you don't feel a hundred, a hundred, sorry, a million bucks in life. I would, I would look at eliminating oats, no doubt about it. And I, I really encourage people to have a high protein breakfast. You know, have steak in the morning, have something that's, that's delicious. You know, I, there's nothing better than me waking up in the morning and having a nice, juicy porterhouse steak or some mince with two raw eggs and you know, cooking it with butter and having a little bit of vegetables and maybe some grilled mushrooms and some capsicum. But I mix up my breakfast every day. You know, one day it could be four, four raw eggs. The next day it could be an omelet. The next day it could be some mince or some steak or some chicken or some turkey. You know, mix it up every day. Um, one of the other things is I would recommend, especially for the business person who's listening out there, you know, I understand these guys, they have full on days, you know, where they'll wake up at uh, 6 a.m. in the morning and they have to be at work at 8 and they work right up until, you know, uh, you know, 6 or 7 at night. These guys, you know, I recommend you guys to get in the habit of having a steak in the morning. And the reason why I say that is because it's going to satiate you for so much longer than what oats or, uh, you know, eggs or even, um, you know, like muesli bars or anything like that, it will, it will, it will fill you up and it will, um, allow you to work longer and harder and be more focused. And the first 30 grams of protein that you eat goes towards your immune system. So that's also a very good thing. So, you know, I'm a very big advocate of, of eating red meat. Um, you know, I like my red meat raw, but that's a story for another day. But yeah, that's, that's what I'd recommend, you know, getting out of challenge the status quo. Just, I tell people it's, it's something hard for a lot of people to give up, but just do it, just do it for, for a couple of days, just just have steak or minced meat or um, eggs even or, or something different in the morning. Cut out the oats and see how you feel. You know, everyone who does the steak thing always reports to me they feel a lot better and they don't get as hungry. And when 10 o'clock comes, they're not searching for another coffee or a V energy drink or anything like that. They're sustained. And, and that's honestly, that's what a good breakfast should do. But, you know, definitely your, your, your muesli bar types of cereals will, will never do that. So, um, yeah. Yep, and uh, about toxins, can you tell me a little bit about toxins? Uh, toxins. So toxins, are, you know, we, we've dumped over 85,000 toxins in our environment since World War II. Um, toxins are a growing issue. I had a really awesome interview with Mark Schaus. He was the author of the um, Achieving Victory Over a Toxic World, really awesome book, and I had him on Maximus Radio. So we, we the whole podcast is dedicated to toxins, and he's one of the best in the world when it comes to toxins. So definitely have a listen to that. Um, yeah, so as Mark and I talk about, there, there are new toxins in our environment have, that, have, that are being introduced and we've never really seen. You know, we're introducing things that have never really interacted with the human body before. Um, one of the, I wrote an article for T Nation a little while ago called Fighting the Tea Killing Toxins. And in that article, I explain how in the 60s, men's sperm count was, I think it was 115 milliliters uh, 
per decil, whatever they measure it in. And now, today, it's only 60 or 40 million, which means that our sperm and, and testosterone and all these things are on the, a great decline. And a lot of people point the finger at toxins. I'm definitely one of those people who would point the finger at toxins when we consider the fact that um, chemicals like BPA, bisphenol A, which was originally developed and designed as a uh, as an, an estrogen product, as an estrogen uh, replacement product uh, supplement, um, that they found out that that actually made plastic shatterproof, and they started and the chemical manufacturers used this to make their their bottles shatterproof, and now that's what we drink bottles out of. And you know BPA and phthalates, which is in plastics, we use these are these a lot of these different toxins that they're, they're testosterone lowering. And when something interacts with our endocrine system, see the thing about toxicity is that toxicity used to be only classified as the the dose makes it toxic, meaning that you know if you have a you know one zero point one uh, you know, milligram or micro milligram of um, of mercury today, you're going to be okay. You know, but let's say, for example, we inject you with five grams of mercury, you're going to be hugely toxic. So the dose actually determines whether you're toxic or not. But when we introduce things like phthalates or BPA or um, parabens or any of these type of different toxins, they actually work on the hormone system. So you you can't only a little bit makes you toxic because it's it's actually affecting what your hormones are doing. Um, they're, they're called zyno zytoestrogens or phytoestrogens. Um, so they're foreign estrogens to the body and they act like estrogens and they, they downregulate testosterone and testosterone suppressing. So toxins are, are a big issue and I think, I think there will be a lot more books published on this in, in years to come. Um, it is kind of one of those underground issues at the moment, but it is getting a lot more light. And what I'd recommend for people to do is to go on, especially the female listeners out there, is to go on to www.ewg.org forward slash skin deep. Um, the EWG, the Environmental Working Group, have analyzed over 45,000 um, makeup and cosmetic type of products and they tell you what's actually in it. So, you know, for example, a female who's waking up every day and, and using lipstick or whatever, that could contain a lot of different um, toxins in it from mercury to lead to parabens to you name it, okay? It, it, could, be, it could be in it. Um, if, you can, if you can look up those products and find out which products are safe to use and which products are not safe to use um, and, and start using the safe products or the clean products, you'll be a lot better off. Oh, Awesome. And with protein powders, what's your stance on those? Protein powders is interesting because I mentioned this in uh, my seminar, Eat You Out of Wabs, that just passed. But yeah, protein powders, again, this comes back down to, I guess, religious dogma of the industry that you have to have a protein powder after a workout. Now, the more research I've done suggests that you don't have to actually do anything. Okay, and, and this kind of challenges a lot of people. But if people look up the work of Mario Di Pasquale or even Dr. Art Devaney, and I have a lot of respect for these two gentlemen, and I'd, I'd love to have them both on my show very soon. But all right, Dr. Art Devaney talks about how when, when you work out, okay, when you train, there are actually damaged proteins inside the muscle already. So why are we having protein powder to send more proteins when the body's actually trying to remove the damaged proteins outside the muscle? That's argument one. Argument two is that most of the research about, I guess, insulin sensitivity um, and having a protein shake after a workout is really done by people uh, fronting supplements, okay, supplement companies, in other words, um, are really the ones fronting that research. But more specifically, what they're actually looking at is... Um, glucose uptake or glucose inside the muscle, they're not actually looking at protein synthesis. So how can we objectively say that uh, protein powders are a must? That's, that's, that's kind of an argument there. Um, it's not that I'm against protein powders, but the, I guess the, the warning label I would put on protein powders is this. Number one, you, you, you never replace your meals with protein powder. If you're not eating, if you want to put on muscle and you're not eating, let's say, six proper meals a day or you're supplementing with meals during the day, you're doing yourself a disservice. Protein powders were never designed to supplement your meals with, okay? Have them after a workout. And if you go back into Perry Raider's, uh, he had, what was it? Perry Raider was the publisher of, I think it was Iron Man magazine, you know, back in their 50s, that, that's when, you know, I guess soy protein powder was really on the rise where they realized how lucrative the, the protein supplement industry was because, you know, barbells and dumbbells, you, you'd sell them once, but protein powders, you know, every month people were coming back to buy more and more and more. So they knew it was lucrative. And, and to my knowledge, he was the first who kind of put a diet program in his magazine that 
basically went along the lines of at every meal of the day, you have a protein powder, which makes a lot of money, but to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. So that, that's disclaimer one. Disclaimer two is if you are buying protein powder, make sure the protein powder is sourced from New Zealand. Um, and why New Zealand? New Zealand have the best laws, uh, or I guess animal laws in the world, and most of their cows are grass-fed, and they're free of antibiotics and free of hormones and all those, all those nasty stuff. And the other thing, the other caveat I would say is make sure it's processed at low temperatures. Um, so, you know, you, you don't want to, you don't want rapid heating or rapid processing because that essentially creates carcinogenic agents, which, you know, carcinogenic agents cause cancer. So, you know, you want to avoid these things at all costs. So that they're, they're things that I would recommend, um, you know, and again, protein powder, I think, for a lot of people, is not needed, especially if you're looking to lose weight. People use it as a meal replacement. You need to get in the lifestyle of eating a proper diet. You don't, you know, supplements for me are, are adding addition to. You don't need to necessarily supplement with protein if you're on a high protein diet. And the other thing, the other, the other point I'll make before I move on, and if people want more information, come to my seminar. But before I move on, is that. In nature, um, you know, whenever we did have protein, we also had a high concentration of vitamin A. Um, vitamin A, high, a high protein diet will deplete vitamin A, but you need vitamin A to absorb protein. So, meaning that in nature, when we have a like a full egg, you know, to these days people are scared of eating full eggs. But the fact is, when we eat full eggs or meat with the fat on it or butter, that's that, that, that there's protein in in a full egg, obviously, but there's also the vitamin A concentrate there as well that helps us digest it. And vitamin A and the fats in that is so important. So you know, in a protein powder, all we're getting is the protein and no fat, which in a sense isn't isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, for a lot of people, it's not a good thing because they're already low in vitamin A. Um, which which they they need they need more fats in their diet that's that's why they're not building muscle so yeah so I'm guessing you're not a fan of the um the liquid diets that are out there not at all not at all um again people need to get in the and again it's not that I just want to make one thing really clear it's not that I'm against protein powders it's that they're a supplement and it's kind of a religious supplement that people they they accept because there's so much marketing behind it that you know is it truth or is it marketing and for a lot of it it's marketing not everyone needs a protein powder it's it's the first thing when people come into the fitness industry it's like oh i better get on a protein powder no get on a multivitamin get on some fish oil get on some zinc get on some magnesium um they're they're much more important they are much higher on my list than a protein powder because protein you can get from food it's not something that most people lack um so yeah a, a liquid diet again that that's something like that would would advocate unhealthy eating behaviors and everyone needs to, to learn a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's move on to something else here about store-bought milk. What's, what are the problems with store-bought milk? I mean, there's a number of problems with store-bought milk. A, a reference that I'll reference people to is um, www.westernaprice.org. Um, you can look up one of Sally, I believe it's one of Sally Fallon's uh, articles uh, about milk. That she's got plenty of stuff about raw milk there, and I'm an advocate of raw milk, but in a nutshell, commercial problems with store-bought milk. Okay, so number one, uh, your store-bought milk, most of it will come from grain-fed cows. Now, grain-fed cows live a lot a lot shorter lives lifespan than grass-fed cows. The other thing about grain-fed cows, grain-fed cows can produce up to 22,000 liters of milk per year, whereas, uh, oh, sorry, in their lifetime, not per year, in their lifetime because they don't live that long, whereas a, um, a, a grass-fed cow only produce up to 8,000 liters. There's a higher allowance for pus in the milk on, in grain-fed cows than grass-fed cows, not to mention the antibiotics that are also going into the milk um, and the fact that once that milk is obviously taken, it's, it's removed, it's extracted from the cow, um, it, it then gets processed, highly processed with you know, pasteurization, hom- uh, homogenization, um, that, which is, is, in a sense, pasteurization is rapid heating, you know, and, and that is to sterilize the milk. Now, when you rapidly heat milk, all the enzymes and, and all the, the goodness that was once in the milk is now void. It's not there anymore because you've rapidly heated, you've, you've denatured the milk. Um, I was speaking to one dairy farmer and she also warned me that a lot of people are putting in things like paint thinners into milk. Now, I can't confirm whether that's true or not. But the point here is this. You, you really don't know what's going into that uh, commercially store-bought milk because you really got to look at the health of the cow. Uh, and I know I'm probably sounding like some environmentalist, but 
you know, in some point I am, but more of a more to what more of I am is someone who really cares about what goes inside, what the quality of the food that people eat. So, with the with the commercial milk, you, you have this rapid heating process. And let me ask you this question: you know, in a, in a lot of these physicals and what do you call them, revs and all that type of thing, they have on the label now with added vitamin C, now with added calcium, now with added vitamin D. Well, if you look at raw milk, raw milk is already high in all of these things. Why do you need to fortify milk with more calcium? Isn't it supposed to be high in calcium? Isn't it supposed to be high in vitamin C? Isn't it supposed to be high in vitamin D? Well, it is, but when you pasteurize and bastardize a product like milk, it does become void of all its nutrients, and and that's essentially what's happening, and that's why I have a lot of problems with commercially store-bought milk, is the fact that you can't really call it milk. It's not what milk used to be, and a good example of this is I got some um, bath milk which I drink bath milk, and some people would think I'm crazy. Bath milk is, I guess, code word for raw milk. And, um, you know, I, I gave some to my mum without any hesitation, and she turned around and she said, this tastes like the milk that I drank when I was a little girl. Now, isn't that interesting? This tastes like the milk that I drank when I was a little girl. That was real milk. When, when she was drinking milk, she was drinking the good stuff. When, when uh, food laws weren't bastardizing, um, you know, food that we eat today. So I, I think milk... Store-bought milk leads a lot of problems. Um, it's one of the biggest allergies that, that people can have reactions to. Dairy is a very cross-reactive food, so a lot of people can have a lot of problems with dairy. Um, dairy. And the other thing is, you know, you go back 20 years or even 10 years or even when I, you know, a couple of years, the fact is today you go into a kindergarten you cannot bring peanuts, you know, sultanas, you can't bring, you know, now there's a full food list of things that you can't bring into a kindergarten. If you go back or a primary school or even, I don't know about high schools these days, but there's all these rules about what parents and kids can and can't bring to school. If you go back 20 years, those rules were never there. Allergies are on the rise. Why are they on the rise? It's because we, we keep bastardizing the food supply. Um, and you asked me, that, I guess, that question before about what do I think is wrong with nutrition today. Again, the fact is, is that what's driving all this is how do we do it cheaper and faster and get it to more people? And commercial, commercially store-bought milk is a victim of how can we do it cheaper, how can we do it faster, and how can we get it to more people? And, and um, you know, cut the middleman out. That that it's a victim of that. It's not that milk raw milk is, is. I think there's a lot of benefits to raw milk if you can tolerate dairy. And the fact is, not everyone can tolerate dairy, um, which is completely fine. But if you can, you know, raw milk's a good choice. But commercial milk, it's it's not what I would call milk today. Yeah. So the stores have really bastardized food and milk prices. Well, it's it's not the store. It's it's really you know can't go back to the higher level uh, food manufacturers. You know, and I mean the the who, whose fault is it? So, I mean, this this leaves a lot, of, and this is a podcast in itself, you know. Um, whose fault is it? Is it the consumer's fault? Is it the government's fault for not protecting us? Is it the food manufacturer's fault? You know, at the end of the day, I'm going to say to everyone, because I, I'm not going to be, you know, there's only so much we can do about government. There's only so much we can do about politicians and all that type of thing. But there is a lot that we can do within ourselves. And one of the things that we can do within ourselves is make a choice. We can make a choice not to buy these foods. And yeah. Food manufacturers, they want to make money. So when there is a demand on a product and we vote with our dollar and we say, no, we're not going to take this anymore. We want real food. No, guess what, Safeway? Guess what, Coles? We're not buying food from you anymore because you produce shit. Your apples, when we go inside the, the, the store, you know, they're, 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 they're shit. They don't taste like apples. There's no other way to say it. And, you know, excuse my French, but it's it, it really needs to get to that point where people start buying more from their local organic grocer if, if possible and buying from local places and farmers and then that's when these places like Safeway you know they're, they're smart business people they're, they're conglomerates because they're smart at what they do in business and they understand consumer demand and when there is a consumer demand for healthy food they're going to refine the game they're going to they're going to make it you know at least I like to choose to believe that this is what they would do is that they will start supplying the, the broader masses with healthier food that's the way I'd like to see it done. So consumers, if you're listening to this, make a choice every time you go to the supermarket and buy something, you're voting. Yeah, cool. I have a question of Facebook from Andrew. She's from Finland. Yep. It asks, if it could be simplified and summarized, what would you say is the most important thing or things or best measurements for gauging fitness? 
Well, that's an excellent question um, from Angel. Um, the best gauge of fitness. Well, I mean, fitness is, is really a, a personal thing. So I think for me to say to you that, um, you know, this is what you should be doing would be a mistake because you're probably not inspired by the same things that, that I am, that as you are. So let's say, for example, my goals at the moment, I'll just share with the listeners, you know, one of my goals is to do a chin up with 60 kilos attached and to get my bench press up to 140 and to get my deadlift up to 145, uh, 245 kilo. It's all in kilo, by the way. We are. This is. I am from Australia, obviously. And if there's any American listeners, obviously, I know you guys use pounds, so you can do the conversion. But the point is that my goals, is, a lot of my goals, are centered around getting strong. And obviously, I'm competing in Definitions Strongman Competition November first, which will be an absolute ball, and I welcome everyone to come down to. But the fact is, a lot of my goals are centered around strength. Now that inspires me, so I use them a gauge for my fitness, whereas a very close friend and client, Janet, uses you know how lean she is, how she looks, because that's her sport. Her sport is um, you know bodybuilding. It, it's fitness competitions, and you know winning a title is, is good feedback for her. Whereas for you, it, it might simply be that um, you know you can get into your skinny jeans, or you can get into that that you know hot dress that you wanted to wear, or um, you feel better, you, you sleep properly, you get up without uh, needing a coffee. So w- what's the best way to gauge fitness? I think it's, it's a really personal thing. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, wary of giving you any absolute gauges, but I think in any fitness program, you do need a component of strength um, because in a male or female, strength is very important. And in a lot of the... Like, there's a, there's, you know, there's a, there was a paper published in Tufts University in Houston, which suggested and showed that people's quality of life as they got older was determined on two factors, how strong they were and how much muscle mass they carried. So I think uh, not that you need excessive amounts of muscle mass uh, if that's not your thing, but I think having some muscle mass is definitely a, a good gauge and how strong you can get You know, is nothing better. I think for females, especially knowing Angel, I think for females doing um, a certain amount of chin-ups is a very good gauge of strength. Chin-ups is, is a great gauge for, you know, it's very empowering, I find, especially training females when they can actually lift their own body weight in a chin-up uh, form. So, you know, I would use that as a gauge, how many chin-ups you could do, that, that would be a suggested gauge with perhaps a couple of of others that are, um, I guess, personal to you, whether that be, you know, you, you sleep properly, you get up, you jump up out of bed, um, or, you know, just a, a feeling that you get, if that answers the question. Well, I hope that answers it for Angel. Now, moving on to our, um, coming to a close here, can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how they can learn more about you? Well, Eat Your Way to Abs, um, is that, yeah, so the, I've got a seminar coming up called uh, Eat Your Way to Abs, which is, um, if they want to learn more, they, they're more than... Welcome. There's, I've got a um, my, my website. I've got f- uh, five websites at the moment. Um, I'll just talk briefly about two of them. One of them is obviously where you're probably listing this from. This is maximusmark.com. This is where I do all my blogging, podcasts, articles. Um, this is kind of the central site where you know all the information is and the, the podcasts are. Then I've got eatyourwaytowabs.com, which is um, you can go on, put your email in, and you get my free Eat Your Way to Wabs program. But what I'm running, I, I just like to talk about this before we close is is the seminar that's coming up on november the 19th um it's it's obviously called under the same name eat you out of wabs where you basically spend a full day with me goes from 10 a.m in the morning till five at night and we we go for it you know i summarize you know we've spoken about a few things today and if you've liked what, what i've said today I get so much deeper. You know, I've got presentations, just presentations on gluten, just presentations on uh, calories, just presentations. I get Janet to come in and talk about bodybuilding. I talk about them, a whole presentation on values and setting goals and getting your mind right so that you can achieve what you want to achieve in the fitness industry, as well as I, I encourage people to ask me as many questions as they possibly can uh, through the whole day so they walk out really understanding. Um, you know, I've already got, what I think, nine people who are booked in as of today so i believe the room only holds maximum 23 people so there's only a few more people i can take in but um you know i'd love to have people people come down enjoy it um you've you've attended it twice and you know um i hope that you've enjoyed it as well and the feedback that i've always got from the seminars has been really fantastic so i welcome everyone to come down all you need to do is go to maximusmark.com forward slash radio um it's 149 dollars i believe or 147 i always get confused between the two just make the payment online and i hope to see everyone there 
November the 19th. It's a Saturday. Now, those seminars are definitely getting better and better per, per seminar, I say, saying that I've been to tour and everything. But thanks for everything today, Mark. Thanks for answering those questions. And we'll hopefully get in touch soon. No worries. Thank you so much, Chris. No worries. See ya. See you, mate.